is we'll try and catch up because there wasn't time really for proper discussion and questions immediately after Dan or myself or indeed after Jessa. So let's put that to right and people can ask anybody any questions or indeed because this is a panel discussion, uh, raise uh, points for discussion. Um, thanks, Jeff. This is Uma from Agriculture Victoria. And um, thank you very much for all the wonderful talks. I just wanted to ask about um, consumer attitudes when it comes to products of hot culture. Consumer attitudes are shifting towards uh, people accepting um, product that is, uh, is produced using um, less pesticides, but that has not been quantified. Is there any effort to quantify that and use it as a, a way of uh, marketing conservation or uh, biological control to producers? Well, what I might do is jump in there and make a brief response to that question, Umar, and then we can open things up for other responses. Um, as part of the horticulture innovation project that I spoke briefly about in my talk, we did interviews with uh, dozens and dozens of vegetable growers around the country. And it was really enlightening in terms of aspects such as you mentioned, Dumar, that whilst many growers recognize that there's a growing market for kind of clean green produce, there are some really important drags on that. And we heard some horror stories like some farmers were complaining that they'd had to cut down gum trees and other native vegetation around their fields because gum nuts and gum leaves were blowing into the crop and being considered to be contaminants by supermarket buyers. So, you know, unfortunately, this, this kind of attitude that we've got as consumers in Australia of going to the supermarket shelf and picking our lemons or picking our lettuce off of the rack there, we always, just because of human nature, go for the most perfect looking produce. And I think, unfortunately, that creates a, a flow on problem because anything that's slightly imperfect looking is not selected, it's left behind. And uh, because many members of the public are a little bit sort of um, naive about such things, they might see a ladybird or a spider and react with horror, uh, with horror, I should say, um, rather than see that as perhaps an indicator that the, the head of lettuce came from a clean green production system. So Umar, I think we've got a long way to go on that front. I, just I, I agree. Like I just like to add on it from my, my little experience as, as with thy organic farmers is they're constantly being approached by their primary um, consumers like Woolworths, Aldi, Coles, on what are you doing to make your farm more, um, more sustainable, more um, friendly to the surrounding natural environment. And so that's why they're interested in trying all these new things and, and letting me do my research and, and probably others do their research. Hmm. Thanks, Jessa. Uh, Dan. Yeah, I was just going to, I guess, concur with you, Jeff, that um, in fact, supermarkets remain a huge, a huge stumbling block. We've had growers who've done an, a very, very good job of producing a crop of say sweet corn with absolutely minimal pesticides and at the 11th hour just before they send it to market they spray it with a very toxic pesticide because the supermarket will reject it if there's a ladybird beetle or if there's a, a lacewing um, present in the crop and and that's that's somehow tragic you know like they, they've done a great job and, and and we're still contaminating with pesticide at the point of consumption it's a crazy world yeah. and in fact uh, just to kind of return to my uh Kind of experience working with growers in this uh, Port Innovation project, those vegetable growers that had most strongly embraced conservation biocontrol techniques were those that were vertically integrated, that sold their produce at farmers markets and things yeah. like that, where they could, they could tell the story about the production system and speak to a slightly more sophisticated consumer audience. Whereas the growers who were hooked into supermarket contracts face just those barriers that you've been talking about then. Okay, let's, uh, let's kind of 
throw the net wide open. We've still got um, a little while. Uh, so there's plenty of time to ask questions to Lachlan or Jessa about their particular studies, which were very, very interesting. Or we can um, talk about, you know, more overarching things, if you like. Uh, just while people are perhaps thinking about uh, a question, I might ask one, take chair's prerogative and ask one to Jessa. And maybe I missed it in your, your uh, presentation, Jessa, but I'm, I'm wondering about the size of the fields that you're working with. And you concluded that there was perhaps uh, not very compelling evidence of um, kind of benefits of natural vegetations, but just how big were the fields in which you um, were working? Roughly, so that each field um, it does vary, but they're roughly 300 meters by 150 meters. Oh, they're decent size. 200 meters, they're commercial scale. Yeah. Um, and then there's at least 100 meters of riparian vegetation, which is the non-crop habitat that I was looking at. And the the it, I know that may, people may misinterpret the findings, but the important thing is there is some pest control being provided. It appears to be uh, it could it could be from specific natural enemies, and that's why that these these yeah. metrics of diversity that we try to use to predict okay. pest control, um, it doesn't seem to correlate with that currently. So yeah. that that's that's the that's the finding. <laughs> yeah, that's fair enough. I'm not challenging that for a moment. So I'll just make the point that um, when we talk about natural enemies, it's an extraordinarily diverse uh, kind of category, isn't it? Is everything from a a large ichneumonid that might fly 100 meters in the blink of an eye uh, through to perhaps certain beetle or spider taxa that uh, are walking around. And so for them, um, they are unlikely to move more than a couple of meters in a day. So um, for those much more fragile taxa, a 300 meter uh, long field is is nothing. They, they can kind of fly in from some donor habitat as easily to the center as they can to the edge. Yeah, the, well, that's why I think I see those differences with those community composition plots that I was doing to see how the community is overlapping in these different areas. Because And then once you get, once you look at just the subset of that community being natural enemies, you see more overlap and it's probably because they're moving more. Okay, I see Vesna, you, welcome, you just turned your camera on, are you angling to ask a question? Yeah, I was also wondering, I was sorry I was interrupted um, during your presentation, so maybe I missed it, um, but were your fields sprayed with anything? So my, my fields, during yeah. my study there was no spraying, so while I was conducting my experiment there was no spraying, and then everything from... But was there spraying before? Yeah. Could but, but only, only of chili oil. <laughs> so, yeah. And it's organic. Um, it's or, been organic and, and certified oh. organic for a few years. Just be cautious that um, you don't fall, we don't fall into the trap of thinking that because it's organic, it's not toxic. Yeah, uh, yeah, I know. <laughs> um, Pyrethrum and uh, sulfur, of course, can be highly toxic to... Um, beneficial insects and mites and, and yet they're organic. So um, we need to be cautious there. Um, you did, in your, your graphs, Jessa, I, I, maybe I misinterpreted, but I got the impression that in the open cages, you had lower mortality of caterpillars. Did I, was that right or? No, so, well, it, it could be a little bit confusing. Um, I'm easily confused, by the way. No, it's, it's all right. You can, you can talk about mortality being high or you have the survival being low. And so the first graph I show you, it's to be easily interpreted. I show how the percentage of the caterpillars decreases in the open cages and it, it decreases at a, um, the, at a greater rate than those um, in the control cages. So you see, those in controls surviving at higher rates than those in predator exposed. Well, Jeff, Jeff, if you're looking to continue any discussion, I was a bit interested in your um, comments about crisis mode, I think, with the growers. And uh, I kind of agree also that all too often we are approached by industries or growers 
when the current systems have failed. And uh, it's a bit of a shame somehow, um, but it's, in, it's interesting just how crisis does drive change. And, uh, and you know, a good example is things like, uh, you know, growers who are spraying more and more and more for less and less and less with say something like thrips management. Um, and, uh, and a bit like that example I showed you too of the management of silver, uh, serpentine leaf miner, you know, where the growers are putting on a horrendous array of pesticides and achieving a very poor outcome. And that's the sort of thing that often is the driver for, for change. It's, um, it's a little bit tragic. I sort of reckon it's a bit like going to the doctor just after you've had a heart attack. <laughs> it's probably better than not at all, but it's a shame you've left it so late. <laughs> yeah, missed opportunity. Yeah, I think there's a lot there in what you say, Dan. And uh, I'll just tell you a very brief anecdote that I think will support that. So um, with your help, Dan, though, this was 20 years ago, you might not recall, you kindly gave me some trichogramma carvery, and I did some, some work using that in an organic vineyard and showed that growing nectar plants at the base of the vines and then releasing trichogramma carvery was a, a really good approach and it gave you better levels of control of light brown apple moth compared to areas where the vines didn't have nectar plants sown underneath them. And we published that work in, in a very good couple of journals and they're well cited papers. But you know what? When I went to industry to try and get some funding from them to pursue this and scale it, not interested 20 years ago. But it's changed a lot and, and now Wine Australia have been quite generous with their funding and they're really being quite proactive and uh, pursuing the whole issue of ecosystem services very very strongly. I, I'm sure you're right and, and like I said too I think we are seeing the signs of change. Sadly however um, it's still and I guess I'll use the example of Persimilis which is one of the um, you know the longest sort of produced by control agents in recent history at least it has a very very long and successful sort of story behind it for management of spider mites in a range of uh, crop situations and uh, there was a time i'm going to say 25 years ago when there was production of persimilis in australia um, the uptake was actually on the increase and uh, the adoption i should say and it was uh, it was doing a good job and then abermectin came on the market and persimilis almost almost ceased to, like no, similar production almost went out of business in Australia because of the advent of a new effect of miticide. And tragically, often it does happen that we, we make really good progress, we get industries onto um, adoption of biocontrol techniques and strategies, and then a new chemical comes out which offers the world and <laughs> in a flash, <laughs> in a flash. So I guess what I'm gonna say is sadly, most growers still love a good poison, but those poisons, <laughs> those poisons are, um, diminishing and becoming less effective. And I guess we are seeing a general trend in the right direction, not always for the right reasons, but nevertheless in the right direction. Yeah, good point, um, Dan, thanks. Look, unless anyone has got a particular question, what I might just do is, uh, I see we've got Ashley Zemek in the audience. And for those that don't know, Ashley is a program manager at Hort Innovation. So she works with many different crop industries and I wonder, Ashley, if you might like to kind of provide a comment, a comment on this issue of um, industries being on the front foot and, and receptive nowadays to these approaches. Um, are you still with us, Ash? Yeah, I am, Jeff. Great. Hi. Yeah, sorry to put you on the spot like this. It's lucky you hadn't ducked out for a cup of tea. Well, yeah, it's lucky I wasn't bringing the washing with the rain. <laughs> um, no, I thought the talks were great. And I guess from our perspective, as a group who's pretty pro IPM, it's an easy answer for us. We say, go ahead and do it. And I guess what we face with growers is really about that economic threshold. Um, and for them, it can be quite low for any insect damage which means quite early on, if they monitor and they find the pest, their view is that that's too high. And then that's a spray solution as opposed to relying on um, other IPM, such as conservation or biologicals. 
So for example, a lot of our industry, the biggest barrier is just that impact to viable products. And as you mentioned, supermarkets demand certain specifications. Um, a, a case of note was a while back when I think a red back was found on a broccoli and that caused major outrage from the consumer. And then we actually did a, did a project to try and understand where the red backs would be entering the crop. And it was found to be in the storage containers for after harvesting. Um, but yeah, so any insect damage or insect presence is viewed as non-desirable and that has a big impact on growers. So we are doing what Dan mentioned before is like they might have IPM throughout the growing season, but before harvest, they might do a spray just to make sure they get premium crop, especially if they're looking at uh, exporting. So export markets are even more stringent than uh, coals and woolies. And so I guess that's what growers are faced with, those, meeting those expectations um, and trying to find IPM that works for them. There are some crops that do it better than others, um, but I think it's quite difficult. And as I mentioned in the chat, there's also no price premium on IPM. So you might have a great system in place where you're doing great monitoring, you're only using targeted chemicals only when you have to, but you're not getting any more money for the extra work and extra cost those chemicals are to you. And it's something that also um, protected cropping industry is facing. So for protected cropping, you have great control of the environment, you can stop those outside pests, you can limit your water use and your fertilizer, but it's an expensive system to get in place and can be more expensive to run, but there's no price premium for protective cropping growing crops. So that's kind of this uh, whirlwind that's happening at the moment. I don't know if I answered your question, Jeff, but basically that's what the growers are feeling every day. Well, it's really useful to have that perspective from industry from you, Ash. So thank you very much for your, um, your uh, contribution there. All right, it's 3.31 and I think time for a cup of tea. But do please come back, come back and join us at, uh, at um, four o'clock New South Wales time because we've got a series more great talks in store for you about this wonderful field of biological control. So um, yeah, grab a cup of tea, stretch your legs and uh, come back soon, please. Uh, oh, sorry, round of applause for all of our speakers, especially the youngsters, they did a really good job. <laughs> All right. Bye-bye for now, folks.